Welcome, and in this video course, we are looking at the CyberOps Associate Version 1 course. This course is going to cover the skills and knowledge needed for successfully handling the tasks and duties, responsibilities of an associate level security analyst working at a security operations center. The goal of this video series is to help prepare learners for the Cisco 200-201 certification. That's focusing on understanding the Cisco Cybersecurity Operation Fundamentals course known as CBROPS. All right, so welcome to module four. We're gonna be doing a Linux overview. So what we're gonna be talking about is some Linux basics. We're gonna be talking about working with the Linux shell Linux as a server and as well as a client. Talk a little bit about the server administration portion of Linux as well as the file system. And then we're gonna end with working with Linux as a GUI and working as Linux as a host. So again, this is not a in-depth video about Linux. This is more about an overview so we understand how to work within Linux within our material for our cyber ops. So with that said, let's jump right into Linux basics. So first things first is what is Linux? Linux is an operating system. It's been around since early 90s. It's open source, meaning that the source code is available. You can review it, you can modify it. There are still terms and services for using it, but realistically, most versions of Linux uses the GNU licensing, which says that you can openly and modify the code uh, however you need to. Linux is classified being fast, reliable, lightweight, meaning it's small or has the ability to have a small footprint. It does require very little hardware uh, interaction. It can pretty much run on anything. So you have an Xbox or a PlayStation, you can probably install Linux on a hard drive and have the processing memory and GPU of those devices run it. Linux is part of several platforms. We can uh, find on almost any type of device, smartwatch, smart refrigerator, treadmill, doesn't really matter. Most of them will run some form of Linux. Linux is designed to connect to a network, which makes things a lot simpler to write and use network-based applications or cloud-based applications. Linux has a large selection of families. So depending on how the source of the Linux code is set up, we can have different distributions or different versions of Linux. Linux is a large umbrella for all of the families of Linux out there. Linux distribution is also the term used to describe the packages created by different organizations. They include the core Linux kernel the core portion of the software, but other than that, everything else is kind of customized based off of the individual or individual organization's needs. So what are the values of Linux? Linux, first of all, it being open source means typically it's free. However, support is may not be as easily obtained because again, not a lot of people may use it in that term. Now, with that said, that statement is very important. In the business realm, Microsoft is king. There's more Microsoft Windows-based PCs than anything. More and more are using Linux because it's free, it's lightweight, it runs on many things. But when you think business, Microsoft still controls that realm. Linux is taking over, is gaining ground, but they're not quite there yet. So the amount of individuals that know Linux as like a, a administrator is not as many as the amount of administrators that know Windows based products. So that's what I mean by Windows is still more prevalent. Linux is open source. Pretty much you can do whatever you want with it, modify it and let other people use it. It's also terminal based. Several versions of Linux have a, a command terminal or a command line interface, which is extremely powerful. Windows has the exact same thing, but it's they're gonna be slightly different. 
a terminal in one version of Linux may be different from a terminal in another version of Linux. The terminal is still extremely powerful in both of them, but that was something to point out. Users have more control over the OS. The administrator in Linux is known as the root user or super user, and pretty much you can modify anything within the operating system. Not sure if that's a pro or a con, but it, it definitely gives you more options. So there is that part of Linux being it's more open for the individual running it to do more of what they need. It allows for better communication control. Uh, again, that's really, really subjective. It provides a certain level of control that may be greater than what you would find in Windows. Oftentimes, Linux is the a more common operating system found in a SOC. And again, that's really, really subjective. But there are more open source tools and that amount of tools are growing every day. So here we have one of the tools we're going to be looking at. It is a pretty, a pretty common network analyzer, but that's getting way more than we need to go right now. Basically, within the SOC, Linux is going to be adding additional features and software for analysis. So as a security analyst, at least having a basic level of understanding of Linux is becoming more important. So Linux has several special versions of Linux that way that's been customized for that analyst and that's called the Security Onion. Security Onion is an open source suite of tools that work together for network security analysis. So here we have SU, uh, S Gully, S Gully, and it's a network analyzer similar to Packet Tracer, but it's not quite the same. And you can drill down into it. So what are some other tools used in a SOC? Normally we have some form of network packet capture software. Uh, Wireshark is going to be one of the more common ones. We have some form of malware analysis tool. And we're going to be talking about malware analysis in separate videos. Lastly, we have our intrusion detection IDSs and our IPSs. Uh, an IDS or IPS like Snort. And we're going to be doing uh, rule filtering with an IDS a little bit later in separate videos because those are also crucial to, to understand. Other tools might include things like a firewall, log manager, some type of SIM. The SIM could be an open source or it could be tied to a Linux distro. And lastly, a ticketing system. This is always one of the more critical, uh, crucial parts because you have to be able to log and track what you're doing. It's not just about the right now. It's about what's happened before, what's documented, what's been verified, what's been done. And the ticket system allows us to, in future events, look back at historical events to see what happened. If you have an incident and that happened six months ago and you're being asked, you know, what did you do to resolve or what made you look at that issue? Without some type of tracking system, it's really hard to know. A SIM and a SOAR kind of go hand in hand. A SIM provides real-time analysis for and a centralized location for alerts and logs generated by the different devices. Gives you a nice dashboard for you to look at. And a log manager is, again, a centralized logging location like a syslog server so that all of the logs can be dumped in one location for quick analysis. So we have Kali Linux is one of the more common versions of Linux. It's not the only one that's used inside of our SOC, but Kali is one of them, especially if you're doing what's called a penetration test or pen test. This is the process of looking for vulnerabilities on a network or a system. Basically you attack them and you see what you can do. You mimic an actual attack so you can see where your weak holes are so you know where to fix them. You also have things like packet generators or port scanners as well as POC or proof of concept type exploits so that you can show 
a, a realistic attack so you know how to better protect your systems and network. Kali Linux is a distribution which contains many pin tools and it's all nice centralized for you and they update pretty regularly. Notice all of the categories for pen testing. We have wireless attacks, password attacks, POIST exploitation based attacks, we have reconnaissance, social engineering, and so forth. Normally within Linux, within Kali specifically, they per keep providing more and more tools and each version or each variation of Kali modifies based off the current tool sets that are in use. So Kali 2017 is going to be different from Kali 2019 or Kali 21 or Kali 2023. They're going to be different tools based off of what's happening at the time. Older tools go away because they're not as useful anymore. So now we have a basic understanding of Linux. Let's look at Linux in the shell environment or the terminal environment. All right, so the Linux shell provides us the ability to work through a terminal to interact with the operating system. You can also have a GUI by default, but I mean, it really just depends on what you're looking for. One way to access the uh, terminal or the CLI is to go to a termi uh, terminal emulator. If you're in Kali Linux, you click, you know, application, terminal. Most versions of Linux will have the terminal or a variation of the terminal easily accessible. In Linux, we don't have a single terminal. We have multiple. So these are also called terminal emulators. We have the terminator, we have the eterm, xterm, console, and genome terminal. While there's other versions out there that as well, it just kind of depends. Uh, we also have a JS Linux, which allows an emulated version of Linux to be ran on a browser as well. So what's interesting is we're getting Linux to be able to run on just about anything. So what's interesting when we go through this material is terminology. I keep saying terminal, even though it says CLI. Well, term term shell, console, console window, CLI, CLI terminal, terminal window, they're all the same thing. They're, they're all interchangeable. All of them are a terminal emulator, the c command terminal, the command line. All of them are just a terminal emulator. It's You can use them interchangeably. And our text will also use them interchangeably as well. So understand that the shell, the terminal is going to be slightly different depending on which book you're reading. Here's an example of a Ubuntu terminal. And this is a pretty common emulator and this is the genome terminal emulator. So at the command terminal you have some basic commands things like mv or move chmod that's going to be the terminal command to modify permissions, chown, that's going to be the ownership of a file, dd are ways to copy data from an input to an output, pwd is present working directory, ps will be the processes, su will be login as another user, or a common one is sudo, and that is essentially do as a super user, uh, grep, ipconfig. ipconfig is similar to ipconfig in Windows. We have the ability to install software if it's a Debian based uh, Linux version. That's going to be apt-get, apt, hyphen git, and then whatever package you want to get. iwconfig, that's going to be for wireless. We have things like uh, shutdown. We have the ability to change the password using passwd. Some people denote that as password. Some people say passwd, it really just depends. We have the ability to concatenate or read a file with the cat command. Then we also have the man command, which is actually a way for us to display the manual or the documentation. And again, the goal here is not to remember what each one of these does. We have labs covering the navigation of these commands. It's more important to kind of get a feel of what the basic commands are and kind of their purpose that way you can slowly understand 
their function inside the grander scheme of using Linux inside of a sock. If we're dealing with file and directory commands, we have things like ls, that's similar to Windows DIR. We have the ability to change directory, cd, that's common in both windows, make directory, mkdir, same thing Windows and Linux. If we're talking about copying files from source and destination, cp, mv is moving, rm is removing, grep is searching, and cat again is about being able to concatenate or read files. So when we're working with text files, even in the terminal, there are many text editors and various functions of each text editor. Some text editors include graphical interfaces, some are command line only. Some editors focus on programmers and include features like syntax highlighting, parentheses checking, and so forth. Some graphical text editors are convenient and easy to use. There are some command line ones that are also easy to use as well. The main benefit of a command line versus a graphical editor is that they allow for text file editing from a remote device through a terminal. Which is best for you? That's the thing is, it really depends on the situation. It really is all about the individual. A common one is Nano. Nano is one of the more popular command line text editors. The administrator is editing a firewall rule, in this example, using Nano, using the command terminal. However, due to the lack of graphical support, Nano or GNU Nano can only be controlled with the keyboard. There is no mouse, there is no, key, uh, there is no mouse moving. It's all through your keyboard and arrow keys. In Linux, everything is treated as a file object. Memory, disks, monitors, directories, everything is a file. So configuration files are just text files which are used to store adjustments and settings for specific applications. A folder is just an, another type of file for it. After the changes are made, files are saved and can be used in relative service or applications. Users are able to specify exactly how they want any application or service to behave. It really all depends on what you want the system to do. For the novice user, this may be too much. However, it gives you the option. Administrators use the command like sudo. And from here, you can actually raise the privilege or you can do a super user or super do so that privileges access certain files that are normally restricted will grant you access. Here we have sudo nano forward slash etc forward slash hosts. Normally this is protected. However, because you're doing the sudo command, it's elevating the task so that you can actually open the host file as a super user. That way you can modify it. Here we have nano and we're using this for editing. This is going to be editing the local hosts file that we'd be finding in etc. Windows has the same file and has the same similar structure. So it's the same type of host file that you'd be expected to find. We do have a lab manipulating text files in the command terminal. We also have a lab getting familiar with the Linux shell. All right, so let's keep moving on. Let's talk about Linux servers as well as Linux clients. So we should already be fairly familiar with client-server communication. A server will ha host a, f a resource, and clients will request and receive those resources. So a client could be a phone, could be a computer, could be a mobile device, it just depends. The resources could be anywhere from a text file, a picture, could be some type of a printer, website, so, so much more. Whatever the server is hosting, it doesn't matter. As long as you realize that the server will host a resource. Common ports are going to be the same regardless of Linux or Windows. These are based off the networking portion. So if we're talking file transfer protocol, FTP, that uses ports 20 and 21, SSH, port 22. Terminal login or Telnet login, 23. 
SNM SMTP for receiving mail. Sorry, for, for sending mail, port 25. DNS is port 53. DHCP is 67 and 68. 69 is TFTP. 80 and 443 are HTTP and HTTPS. POP3 is 110. IMAP is 143. These are also mail protocols. SMTP is used for one way. POP3 and IMAP are used for the opposite way in email. Network time protocol, our time synchronization is port 123. And lastly, we have our SNMP, and that's going to use ports 161 and 162. So again, these are more of the common network ports. This is not an exhaustive list. There are 64,000 TCP and 64 plus thousand UDP based ports. So the goal is not to remember all of them, but to get uh, common ports memorized. So how do we use this in our environment? Well, the clients might upload a file. They might upload a photo via HTTP using port 80 to a file server. Well, how are they taking the file from the device to the server? Is it through HTTP or is it through FTP? If it's through FTP, it may be port 20 and 21. So it really just depends on how we're moving the file. If we're downloading the file, same thing. Are we downloading it via FTP or are we downloading it via HTTP or HTTPS? that changes the port numbers that we are communicating with. We do have a lab looking at Linux servers, as well as some of the command lines to identify servers that are running on a device. So we've talked about servers. So next we have to talk about server administration. It's not just enough that we can handle the server, but we need to be able to use the server effectively. All right, so basic server administration. So Linux services are managed through a config file, text document. So here we have a config file. You'll notice that it will be whatever.conf, just a clever way of saying it's a data file. Common options are configuring uh, port numbers, location of the hosted files or resources, direct paths, things like that. Authorization details as well. So here we can see, let me grab a pen. We can see where to uh, put the error logs. We can see uh, any of the other types of specific things that we want. Processor ID. We can put, I'm going to assume that's going to be the amount of worker connections that are allowed. Within our HTTP portion, we can see things like the default type. It's an octal stream. We can see the logging formats. So it, the logging format will look at remote address, remote user time, request status, things like that. This is useful so we know kind of when it's doing a log what its output it's going to be like. The command output will show a portion of the config file for uh, NGX, which is a lightweight web server for Linux. Could use, you know, Apache, but you know, right now NGX is what it is, so it is what it is. So we have our NTP. If we're looking at our ntp.config, you'll notice, first of all, there's some documentation. The uh, pound symbol show you the documented lines. And then it shows the associated pools. So we have this four set of servers, server 0, 1, 2, and 3. And those are going to be the ntp-based uh, NTP servers. Here we have a IDS and you'll notice it's using snort it's a snort config these are all comments and then we enable certain uh, features and then they start going through and you'll notice a lot of this is commented out this is mainly so that default configuration part of it's going to be test examples things like that so it's really important is there's no rule for a configuration file format it's a choice of you know the developer. Normally it's going to be option will equal a value. 
this is gonna be the default values that we see. So when we set IP var, that should be, next would be the actual value. Sometimes you'll actually see option equal or set to a value. You'll actually see that, this type of structure. It may just be option space value instead. At the end of the day, regardless of the operating system, the OSs have to be hardened. Basically, hardening involves implementing proven methods for securing the device, whether it be Linux, whether it be Windows, whether it be Macintosh or Apple, it doesn't matter. There are hardening guidelines out there for all common operating systems. So some of these methods will involve maintaining passwords or maintaining services, maintaining versions of those services, and so forth. So depending on the Linux distribution, certain services will be enabled by default. Stopping such of those services might be beneficial. If you're not using NTP, maybe disable those services. If you're not using Apache, disable the service. Hardening is a step or criteria. It's not just one process. It's a step of processes. And they may include physical security, minimizing what's actually installed, disabling unused applications and unused services, using things like SSH, but disabling the root account over SSH. That way, that's a proven point for security. Maybe you don't allow root over SSH because that's a huge vulnerability. Keep the systems updated. Maybe disable certain USB auto detect features. Enforce and use strong passwords. Also, enforce a periodic change of passwords and don't allow for reusing of old passwords. This is a common one. A lot of people will force a password change and then people use the same password. So we don't want to do that. We want to get rid of using old passwords. And this is not a complete list. This is just, you know, common things. All right, so moving on, let's talk about monitoring services. In Linux, instead of the traditional log that you might find in Windows, you have things like the application log, event log, service logs, and system logs. And each one of these are gonna be different uh, logs for tracking different purposes. And again, the goal here is to analyze these logs so you get a better picture of what's going on. Some logs will contain information about the daemons that are running in Linux. So a daemon is a background process that runs without the need of a user interaction. So we don't wanna call it a service, but in reality, it's similar to a service. So where are certain log files kept? We have uh, var forward slash log forward slash messages. This will be the generic activity logs. We have a var forward slash log forward slash the auth log. This is for authentication related events. This is for Ubuntu and Debian variations. If we're doing var forward slash log forward slash secure, this will be for Red Hat and Red Hat derivatives like CentOS. This will be the directory that is used for pseudo logins, SSH logins, and other logins by SSS, SSSDs. If we're looking at boot related, that will be underneath var forward slash log forward slash boot dot log. This will be all boot related log information is gonna be located here. We have our D messages, and that's gonna be more about uh, directory information, about ring buffer messages. Our kern.log, this will be things about the kernel. We have our cron, the cron is a service used to schedule automated tasks. So scheduled tasks are, again, another clever way of saying a cron job. We have SQL uh, logs, SQLD and just uh, MySQL logs. Both of these are gonna be all the debugs, failures, success messages. Anything related to SQL is gonna be in the var log, and it's gonna be a MySQL log. And again, not all versions of Linux are gonna have these logs. Not all variations of Linux are gonna have them in the correct location. So part of this is knowing 
where some of the more common logs are, var forward slash log, and exploring what's there. All right, moving on, we have our log services. So we can always view the logs by doing a var log messages. And here is an example. You'll see the timestamps and you'll see what's going on. Don't worry, we have a lab covering our log and log manipulation so that we can understand how to do this a little bit better. Moving forward, we have the Linux file system. So from previous videos, we already talked about what a file system is. So in Linux, again, there's multiple variations of file systems. The purpose is being able to prepare the physical media for storage. So that means speed, flexibility, security, size, structure, logic, and so much more are gonna be based off of that file system. So the administrator needs to decide the file system and the type it's gonna be suitable for the OS. Common ones are XT2. This is the second extended file system. And the fun part with that is, I'm not gonna cover the description of these the, the big one is going to be the XT4. This is the fourth generation, and realistically, modern versions of Linux are going to be using this XT4. This is going to be the better, stronger version of an external uh, file system. Also, it's going to have all of the better performance features. It's also going to be the more secure, more stable, and so forth, because XT2 and XT3 are older versions. They, all of them journal, all of them log everything. Again, they all kind of do the exact same thing. However, XT4 is fourth iteration and has all of the better features. We also have things like the network file system, NFS. Network-based file system allows for access to network files over a file share. We have a optical medium disk. We have that's CDFS. So that's going to be more like CDs. DVDs and Blu-rays have their own variation of them. We also have a swamp file. And the swamp file is used by Linux when it runs out of RAM. We have the same thing in Windows. Uh, it's a swamp file as well. We have things like the HFS Plus, and that's going to be the file system used by Apple. We also have the Apple file system, APFS. So those are two of the big uh, variations, HFS and APFS. Both of these are really important in the Apple realm. However, since this is Linux, why are we talking about Apple products? Both Linux and Apple are derived from the same common core operating system, Unix. After we get rid of our file systems, we discuss those we have to talk about how the data is actually stored on the drive. So the file system lets us save content to the drive. The drive records everything through what's called a master boot record. And that's normally the first several boot sector, or the first sectors of the drive is dedicated for that MBR. And this will store all of the information about the way in which the file system will organize the data on the disk. So mounting in terms uh, used for the processing of assignment of directory partitions. So mounting, that way we can give it a partition. We mount the drive so the OS can give us the drive letter. After we successfully mount the operating system, the file system containing the partition will uh, access and assemble the data needed to boot the OS. The command output will show the output of the mount command issued by the Cisco CyberOps VM. So as it goes through, you'll notice very first mount, and then it will actually do the process, and it will eventually find the mount location, dev sda1 on type ext4, and then it will continue on loading. We have our basic roles and file permissions. Just like Windows, we have our users and groups. Everything will have permission. Everything will have user uh, permissions, group permissions, and special permissions. We can view these by doing an ls space tac l. 
this parameter will list the additional information about our files. Here's an example of us looking at a document called space.txt. You will see, so the first one is if it's a directory or not. The next three are read, write, execute for the user. Next three are read, write, no execute for the group. And then the last one is R special. So the first one defines the links to a file. The third and fourth field will display the user analyst and group staff who owned the file. The fifth will, will display the file size. Then the next field will display date and time of last modification. And the seventh field will be the name. I like how they break down this portion but they did not bother to break down this portion. Users, groups, and special. Oh, I talked too soon. So again, R for read, W for write, X for execute. And these are also given numbered values as well. And the first one is either gonna be no directory or directory. And again, users, groups, and special. So the number value will actually be written like this. So if we have execute, it will be 001. If we have write 010, that's in the two spot. If we have write and execute, we have 011, so that will be one in the two spot, one in the one spot, because this is binary. So that will give us an octal or a decimal number three. If we have read, we have one in the, in the third spot with two to the power of three, sorry. So that will be two to the power of two. This is the first, second, third spot, but this is two to the power of zero, two to the power of one, two to the power of two. That gives us our four. If we have read and execute, we'll have one in the fourth spot, one in the first spot, one plus one, or four plus one is gonna be five. Here we have four plus two gives us six. And if we have seven, that's gonna be both read, write, and execute. So realistically, you may see permissions written like 755 or 777. Again, it's always gonna be user group special if you see 755 user group special, if you see 777, same thing, it's always gonna be user group special. We could hard link files if necessary. A hard link is another way that you can point to the same location of the original file, like a shortcut. You can create a, a hard link using the ln command the first argument in the existing file and the second argument in the new file. That way you can link the two. You can have a symbolic link, which is a system link or a soft link. It's similar to a hard link in that it applies changes to the symbolic link and it will also change the original file. So same thing, we do an LN. However, now we can do attack S to create a symbolic link. And this is actually more in depth than we need to go, but links, symbolic and hard links are pretty common when we're having to remap certain files and we want the OS to treat it as if it was in our source destination. So I can have a hard link look like or pretend like it is a completely different directory. So when we're looking at hard links and soft links, Hard links will locate the hard link. It's gonna be a little harder. Symbolic links are gonna be shown the location of the original file. Hard links are limited to the file systems. Hard links cannot link to a directory as the system itself uses hard links to define the hierarchy. Whereas symbolic links, they can link to other files and other system files as well as directories. We have a lab going through all of this as well. 
Moving forward, we have working with our GUI inside Linux. All right, so the question is, how does Linux get its GUI? So the graphical interface to GUI in most versions of Linux is based off of a system called X Windows. X Windows is also known as X or X11. It's basically a windowing system designed to provide basic frameworks for a GUI. X includes functions for drawing and moving windows on the, the display. It, again, it moves a mouse, keyboard, and, and the overlay. X works as a server which allows a remote user to use the network to connect, start a graphical application, and have the graphical window open on the remote terminal. X doesn't specify the user interface, leaving it to other programs such as the Windows Manager to define all of those components. So, does that mean they're all looking like the same? No. So examples of Windows Manager are things like uh, uh, GNOME or KDE. You'll notice our GNOME Windows Manager is on the left, and that looks one way. Like you button to, for certain versions that you want to use GNOME. Newer versions or other versions of Linux distros will use the KDE Window Manager. Are they the same? Are they similar? Uh, that's the thing is they are pretty similar, but I mean, what's better? That this is really dependent on what you're trying to accomplish. I think honestly, part of that's personal preference. Here we have an example of Ubuntu. We have our top bar, left hand, top left hand side, my top left hand side, the screen's top right hand side, We'll have the activities. There might be an app menu as well. On the opposite side, we'll have our icons. We'll have our start menu by clicking on our icons. Nice thing with that is that's gonna be audio, power, network options, things like that. The entire top center bar is known as the top bar. Ubuntu is one of the more popular variations of a Linux distro. And it's pretty common for users to have a client version of Ubuntu running because it's pretty similar to a Windows environment. So as we drive, dive deeper a little into this, you'll have things like the app menu. That's going to be where all of our apps are. Pretty similar to the start menu in Windows. We have the Ubuntu dock. That's going to be the left hand side of the screen where all the quick launches are. Again, the top bar, that's going to be where we have our main menu, or like our applications, and our uh, active desktops, as well as our start menu options. We have the center bar, which is our calendar and time, and other system messages. We have our activities. That's going to be a switch to application view, to switch or to close running applications. We also have our start menu. That's going to allow the configuration of the network adapter, other running devices, things like that. All of those were on the screen's left-hand side, my right-hand side. All right, so let's get into our last main section, working with the Linux host. So installing and running any application on a Linux host, again, you have to do this as a super user or a root user. So you do sudo space apt tag git and whatever the command is to update you'd be doing update if you want to install uh, nano it'd be sudo app git nano and then it would download the appropriate portions of the program it needed it would also download any of the dependencies that it may need as well by using a package manager to install the packages all the necessary files are placed in the correct location so to do this, we do the app git because that's the main one in the Debian distribution. It's in several distros of Linux, and this is going to be the better option for installing our packages. Now again, to aid it in the installation process, Linux uses programs called packet managers, and these managers are allow us to put all the content in the correct location. Keeping a system up to date, if you are doing certain architectures like Debian or Ubuntu, it would be app install. That would install the package. To remove a package, it would be app remove. To update, it would be app get update. Or to upgrade, it would be app get upgrade. 
So it really all depends on the architecture or the distribution of Linux that you're running. Not all distributions are the same. That's important to note. Not all distributions of Linux are the same. So app get, app install may not work if you're doing Red Hat, for example. So keeping a system up to date, if you have a GUI, there's also a software updater as well. So now that we understand how the OS works and kind of some of the core features, let's look at processes and forks. A process is a running instance of a computer program, while a fork is a method that the kernel will use to allow a process to create a copy of itself. Processes need a way to create processes in multitasking OSs. The fork operation is the only way for Linux to do this. When the process calls a fork, the caller process will become the parent process, and the new created process will become its child. Look at any common web browser. You'll have the common web browser will clone itself every time you open up a new tab, all of them underneath a single parent or single instance of itself. For example, you open up Task Manager in Windows, and you see 10 variations of Chrome underneath a parent Chrome application child parent processes. In Linux, we call the splitting off forks. So after the fork, the processes are the same extent. They're gonna be independent processes. So you can end a single fork instance because they're gonna have separate process IDs even though they're all running the same code. How do you kill certain processes in Linux? We have a PS. That's going to be used to list the processes. Top is used to, uh, used to actually rank them, the running processes dynamically at the very top. And then kill will remove or stop a certain process. Here we have an example of top. It will actually list the top rated programs using the processing power. And it will show you the PID, PID, process ID the user that's running them, the privilege, the virtualization, the resources, things like that. If we're looking at malware, for example, I don't know why they did that quick of a jump, but they did. So in Linux, malware includes all same vari uh, variations that you would find in Windows. Malware is not Windows specific. It could be OS independent. Anyways, Common Linux attack vectors are attacking the services and processes. The command output will only show an attacker using Telnet to probe a web server on port 80. So here we have Telnet, we give it an IP address. Oh, I'm actually surprised they gave a public IP address. And then we're probing port 80. So we're trying to connect to port 80, even though we're using Telnet. And that's a, a, a fire way to see if you can connect. And if you can connect, it can give banner information. We also have the ability to do rootkit checkers. A rootkit is a type of malware designed to increase unauthorized user privileges or grant higher level access. A rootkit is destructive as it changes the way the kernel code operates as well as its modules. Essentially, rootkit will look for certain code in core system files and we do that by going to our check rootkit command so you could sudo and then you give the path name and this will check all core systems for rootkits and you can see if it's infected or not with almost all commands we have the ability to pipe content piping commands basically say that we can add additional functionality so we could do like a ls tac l and we can also then grep certain files if we did an, just an ls tac l we would see everything we could do ls tac host and it will look at just certain files if we do grep files then it will only look at certain files so we can grep certain content based off of whatever we need so point here is we're just piping in Pipe is this guy right here. That is the command above enter. In reality, it's that, even though Windows just displays it as a straight line. And you can use it to pipe in other commands. So we're here we have ls, tac l, and then we're saying include this search 
grep host or grep file and that way host file that way we can see what uh, additional search features we have so we're searching for a file that has host or we're searching for a file that has file in the name in our lecture in our course shell there is a video covering demonstrations of these we have some light labs covering some of these features, not all of them. So if you do need a separate video, reach out to me. I'll be glad to make a separate video on the last section on malware checking, on piping commands, things like that. All right, that is all we had for this chapter. We talked about our main basics. We talked about what Linux is, the terminal, the GUI support, the file system types. And that is it. If you have any questions or concerns, please feel free to reach out. Thank you.